In this part, we will strive to give a complete description of M planes inside a projective space. Let us begin with a vector space V of dimension N. So as usual, K will be a field. And we want to study M dimensional subspaces of V. And that's the Grassmannian. These will be subspaces when V is equal to Kn, which means we have a fixed basis, then we can use a different notation for this. So if V is Kn, then we write G M N for G M V. Tying this back to our definition of uh, linear subspaces in projective space, uh, we see that these Grassmannians will parameterize linear subspaces as follows. The Grassmannian of n plus 1 dimensional subspaces in an n plus 1 dimensional space will be the space of m planes in Pn, or it will be identified with them. And the identification is clear. So if I take w inside of kn plus 1, and there's the natural projectization map to Pn, and there's a natural projectization map of W, and of course this gives an inclusion of Pw into Pn. Now W was isomorphic to Km, therefore this Pw is isomorphic to Pn. So there, sorry, W was Km plus 1. There's also a duality in this notation, so let's talk about this. First of all, let V star be the dual space of V. That means linear maps from V to K. Then we have the following kind of duality between the Grassmannians. If I go from Gm from V to G n minus m to v dual where I take a subspace and I map it to the annihilator of the subspace in v dual. So the annihilator is the space of functions, linear functions, that are identically zero on w. Here n was the dimension of the space v and of course the annihilator of a m-dimensional subspace is going to be of dimension n minus m. And this is a duality because you can uh, go back. So if I give you a subspace of dimension n minus m in v star, then its annihilator will live in v canonically and that will be an m-dimensional space. So here duality refers to the fact that the dual of a dual is the, what you started with. Uh, so V star, star is V, and this gives me this inverse map here, and thereby establishing that this is an isomorphism. So this is very convenient because uh, if we understand low dimensional subspaces, then we understand also very high dimensional subspaces. Let's give an example to this very low dimensional, very high dimensional uh, duality. If I take G1 in V, then this will be identified by duality to N Gn minus 1 of V. And this is something we've seen before. We've discussed this before that G1, V, of course, are subspaces of dimension 1 in V. That's just the projective space PV. On the other side, uh, we realized that Gn minus 1 V, maybe I put a star here, these are hyperplanes or codimension 1 linear subspaces in V star. This 
we denoted previously by a hat. And this was our duality from before. So if we choose coordinates, in coordinates we can write, we can identify V and V star with K N. And then these other dual spaces are just P N or minus ones in this case. When you have coordinates, the duality uh, is the one by just the pairing of the standard coordinates with one another. So use the standard uh, dot product. So the first interesting case, that means the first Grassmannian that is not a projective space is G24. So that parameterizes lines inside of P3. Let's look at this in greater detail and basically everything we do here will foreshadow the general construction of all Grassmannians. Take W inside of V. So here we can identify V with K4 and W should be two dimensional. And then in the coordinates of V, if I pick a basis V1, V2 of W, then we can write it in the spaces as a two by four matrix. So here, uh, the vector VI has coordinates AI inside of the capital V, which is K4. This time, we want to study properly how badly this uh, coordinate system represents planes inside of four space. So we have eight coordinates. That's almost certainly way too much. So let's see what would have happened if we had cho chosen another basis for W. Now, if we pick another basis, v1 prime, v2 prime for w, then there exists a matrix, an invertible matrix, two by two, such that v prime is expressible in terms of v as follows. And the converse is also true. So if I take any invertible matrix two by two and apply it to V1, V2, then I will just get another basis for W. In other words, the over parameterization of subspaces of V via this coordinate system, via these two by four matrices is exactly captured by invertible two by two matrices. So here's the idea that kills this dependency on B by essentially choosing different coordinates. So these coordinates are called Plücker coordinates. The idea is to compute the two by two minors of this two by four matrix representing V1, V2. Compute two by two minors of the two by four matrix A, I, J. Let's represent taking the minors of this two by four matrix with the letter M so that I have M of the matrix AIJ, so the matrix is going to be A11, A22, minus A12, A21, etc. And then in the end, we have so I've taken this 2 by 4 matrix, I computed all the minors. And this gives me six minors in total, so that this gives me six numbers. Of course, the idea now uh, has the following advantage. If I multiply this matrix on the left by a two by two matrix, then the minors change by the determinant of this two by two matrix. Let me write it down. But this kind of indeterminacy we're accustomed to. This is just homogeneous coordinates, which means that if I view my uh, coordinates, my minors as a point in the projective space, then this indeterminacy coming from B vanishes. It gives me a well-defined point on the projective space. So let's write this down.
And the way this map is defined is that you take a subspace W of V, you choose a basis, you write it as a 2 by 4 matrix, and then compute the 2 by 2 minors. And here the end result is independent of the basis chosen for W, so I will just denote it by M of W, the minors of some basis up to scaling, this is well defined. Let's make a couple of crucial observations about the grass mining of lines in P3 while we're here. Now let's take our W again, which will have a basis V1, V2, and the coordinates of these VIs will be AIJs again, but this time I will assume that it, the first 2 by 2 minor is non-zero. Let me write this down. Then I'm going to take uh, the matrix uh, that's defined by the first two by two terms and then invert it. And then I will use this to create another basis for W. What this does is that it puts my coordinates into a very favorable state, which is essentially unique if we insist that the first 2 by 2 block is the identity. So let me write this down. V1 prime, V2 prime is 1, 0, 0, 1. And then I have these coordinates, y11, one, one, y2, 1, 2, y2, 1, y2, 2. So as you can see, you can convince yourselves that these four coordinates yi's or yij's will completely determine w. And conversely, if I have a w, whereas this first uh, minor is non-zero, I can always put it into this coordinates and the coordinates yij's will be completely determined by w. Moreover, it makes uh, perfect sense that uh, I vary yij's in k freely. And of course, this gives me other two-dimensional subspaces in v. This is a natural way to put a space structure on the Grassmannians. So I've more or less defined it as a set, but here I seem to have these affine charts. Uh, the Grassmannian looks locally like these A4s. Whenever a minor is invertible, uh, the remaining coordinates are A4s, and there is some gluing condition between different charts. So we make the following observation that the Grassmannian should be four-dimensional. Locally, it looks like A4, and uh, we can take these coordinates to prove whatever else yeah, we want to prove about the grass money. Another thing we can observe from these affine coordinates is that we can recover W from its minors. Because now compute the minors using this new basis V1 prime, V2 prime, and you will see that YIJs just uh, simply appear as minors. So let's write this down. Of course, what I'm saying here does not require that the first minor to be non-zero, because at least one minor will be non-zero, and then I can just invert that 2 by 2 matrix, and then just do the arguments as before. So that uh, locally, for any given W, locally at that point, the Grassmannian has an affine chart that looks like A4, and moreover we see that the Plücker coordinates, at least uh, locally in that space, are uh, invertible. In any case, from this, it's actually easy to see that the, uh, this Plücker map computing the minors injects the Grassmannian into the projective space. Now, you can also argue that uh, using these affine charts that we discussed, these A4s, you see that, in fact, this map of computing the minors uh, does not annihilate tangent directions as well. So it's, in fact, an embedding, if you think differential geometrically.
Now, as a final thing, we can, in fact, recover the equation defining the Grassmannian lines inside this P5. So I'm going to denote the coordinate functions on P5 by P0 through P5, because these are called Plücker coordinates. And what we do is we go back and look at the minors of V1 prime, V2 prime. So it's these ones here. Now there's an identity that's staring us in the face. The last coordinate is a quadratic expression with respect to the intermediate coordinates. And if you think about how homogenization and dehomogenization works, you will realize that the following homogeneous quadratic equation vanishes on the Grassmannian. And then you can argue that the Grassmannian is four-dimensional. It's a clearly irreducible. It's just a patchwork of A4s. And moreover, this quadric will be irreducible so that what, wherever this quadric is vanishing is precisely the Grassmannian. So the zero set of this quadric, I can identify with the Grassmannian G24 inside of P5. More precisely, the Plücker embedding of the Grassmannian is precisely the zero locus of this quadric equation. Many of the observations that we have made here for the Grassmannian of lines uh, can be made also for the Grassmannian of m-dimensional linear spaces in projective space, and we will do this next.